let's go to our lesson. Let's return to Hebrews chapter 4. And the last three verses, verses 14, 15, and 16 today. Let's read those verses. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. This brief passage refers back to the subject of chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Um, the writer here in chapter 4 is getting ready to prove that Christ's priesthood is superior and was superior to that of the Levites uh, when we get into chapter 5. And he begins uh, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest, that is a reference to the Word of God incarnate. We talked about the Word, the Scripture, verses 12 and 13 last time. We spent our entire um, hour on lesson on that. But uh, here, this reference is a reference to the Word of God incarnate, uh, capital W, O-R-D. The Word made flesh, as John 1, verse 14 tells us. The Word of God, lowercase, refers to the Scriptures. Go back to Psalm 138, with that in mind, Psalm 138 Psalm 138, and I want you to notice one verse there. Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. The written words of God, the scriptures... The Bible says God is going to magnify above uh, the name of Jesus Christ. We're told that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, and yet, the Word of God, the recorded words of God, printed in a book that you and I have access to, are to be elevated and magnified by God one day as the, the most supreme thing in the universe even above whatever name Christ is known by. And since you and I believe that where the word of a king is, there is power, we have good reason to suspect that this book, this book right here, the King James Authorized Version, uh, has a special place in the heart of God. Amen. And that those are the words of God. They're not to be changed, they're not to be altered, they're not to be modified, they're not to be updated, they're not to be revised, they're not to be corrected. They're not to be rewritten. They're to Amen. be believed. A believing heart will yield more spiritual light and fruit and understanding than all the other sources you can run to, all the other books you can consult, uh, every other language or authority, Hebrew manuscripts, Greek, Aramaic manuscripts, Latin manuscripts. All those other things are nothing alongside this book if you believe it. That makes all the difference, believing that this book is the Word of God. opens up. I had a guy uh, um, email me the other day. And it was very complimentary um, about my preaching and my sermon uh, two weeks ago on the King James Bible. And I told him I never began to really learned the Bible until I decided to believe every word in it was perfect. It was placed there by God exactly as I was supposed to see it, exactly as I was supposed to read it. Not to change one thing in it, but let the Bible change me. Suddenly, verses and parts of the verses began to leap off the page at me. 
I'd see something I'd read before, but never paid much attention. All of a sudden, it meant something to me. All of a sudden, it was uh, instructing me and giving me some clues to other things in the Bible and helping me consult other verses of the Bible to learn it like I had never learned it before. And I said, after 35 years, it still does that. And I pray that it'll do it for you. And uh, that's what I wrote back to him. But I remember the, uh, about the fifth time I was reading through my Bible. I was working for um, Focus on the Family. And I'd get there early in the morning. This was around 90, 1990, ooh, about 1989, long in there. And I'd get there early in the morning, about 5.30 in the morning, maybe 6 in the morning. <clears throat> it was dark outside, but there was a security guard by the front entrance and I, we'd wave to each other and I'd walk in, went to our department and went to a conference room, sat at one of those big long tables, um, made a pot of coffee for myself and just sat there and began reading my Bible. Nobody else was around. It was marvelous. Again, about an hour and a half before people start trickling in for work at eight o'clock. And um, I was reading my Bible just as many chapters as I could get day after day and uh, I figured out years ago, if you read uh, 10 chapters of the Bible every day of the week, you can read through your Bible three times in a year with eight unused days left over. But uh, so I was reading the Bible and I got into 2 Timothy chapter 4. Where Paul says to Timothy, uh, the time of my departure is at hand. And he tells him to fight the good uh, fight of faith. Um, and so forth. He's going to have to carry on in Paul's stead. And I, I thought, I started to cry. I didn't want Paul to go. I had to push away from the table and realize what I was just reading happened <laughs> nearly 2,000 years ago. Those events are in, the, in history. But but because the Bible is a living book, it had the ability to reach out and pull me into the story. Yeah. And I was no longer just a passive reader. I was a participant in the narrative. And it was a very powerful uh, moment with the scriptures like that. And uh, now it doesn't always do that. But um, that sure was a wonderful moment at that time to realize how powerful the Word of God can be to the heart that believes what he's reading is the true Word of God and the perfect Word of God. And I suspect that somewhere in eternity, the King James Bible is going to stand and have a prominent place Amen. in the mind of God and the universe uh, because of its power and its authority. And um, it is shaped and created um, so many parts of the English-speaking world, which is the universal language of the world right now. If the universal language of the world is English, somewhere in the world there ought to be an English Bible with the words of God in it. Amen. Amen. And uh, we believe we have, we have it. We each have a copy in our hands. But um, he's talking about the Word of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, there in verse 14. And, uh, and to emphasize this distinction, the, the writer of this part of the Bible, we believe Paul, uh, as Jesus, the Son of God, in the middle of that verse. So he's drawing a distinction between the word, lowercase, and the word, uh, capital letters, uh, the individual, the person, Jesus Christ. Um, seeing then that we have a great high priest, so that we are priests, and uh, we are under a high priest. Go forward just a few pages to 1 Peter chapter 5 or rather, 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, and verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And notice verse 9. Ye are, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, 
a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We offer up spiritual sacrifices, not literal animal sacrifices. Uh, look forward to a couple pages of Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. It's amazing how often verses like that one tie in with the sermon we just preached in our church hour. I didn't plan it that way. It just sort of happens quite uh, often in our Sunday school hour. And then verse 14 says, That is passed into the heavens. Plural. There's more than one. Paul describes himself as such an one caught up to the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. And he writes, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, verse 14. This verse ties the priesthood of Christ uh, into the professions made back in chapter 3. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 again. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Verse 6 there. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And also verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. To hold fast means to hang on to something tightly. Hang on to its security. Don't let go of it. Um, the New Testament believer doesn't need to hold fast on anything lest he lose his salvation. But uh, devotionally, he ought to hold fast on it lest he forget about it. Lest he take it for granted. Lest he become indifferent towards it and, and forget uh, how wonderful and marvelous it is that God would save him and, for, and consider uh, his need as a sinner and write his name in heaven and wash him clean from his Amen. sins and promise to him a glorified eternal resurrected body like that of Jesus Christ and uh, he can't lose it uh, no matter what he does but he can certainly become indifferent uh, and treat it with slight and uh, disrespect and disregard and seek to do little or nothing for Jesus sake um, go back if you will to 2 Timothy chapter 2 2 Timothy chapter 2 I had a chance to talk to a guy that I work with earlier this week and he was asking me about eternal security and um, what that means his church they they seem to believe that you can lose it you're always in danger of losing it unless you're always living a good clean life but uh, I said, well, I, I um, call his attention to these verses here, 2 Timothy 2, and starting there at verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Uh, you and I are part of the body of Jesus Christ. God can't deny you your salvation any more than he can cut his own arm off, cut his own hand off. But he says in verse 12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him in order to avoid suffering, he also will deny us. He'll deny us the chance to reign. Amazing an amazing blessing that every Christian uh, is entitled to, and he doesn't deserve it. And that is this. You might have done nothing for Jesus' sake since the day you got saved. You may have never talked to somebody else who was lost, tried to uh, instruct them or lead them to Jesus Christ or give them a reason to trust Jesus Christ. You might have been a lousy Christian, and you might have lived like all of your carnal friends, even though you were once saved, once upon a time, 
and you might have no real fruit uh, to your credit as a Christian. And um, when you get to heaven, there'll be no extra rewards, there'll be no crowns to cast at the feet of Jesus Christ. And yet, despite your living a horrible life as a, a believer, you're still going to be changed and made glorified like the resurrected Son of God. Yeah. You're still getting a new body. Yeah. Your sins are still forgiven. Your name is still in the Lamb's Book of Life. All of those things you don't deserve. Amen. That is a, a brief glimpse of the marvelous grace of God giving you something that you don't deserve. Yeah. And you said about proving that you didn't deserve it, yet he gives it to you anyway. Yeah. What a wonderful Savior. Amen. Amen. But, so he can't deny himself. He can't take away your salvation because you're part of the body of Jesus Christ. You and I, uh, collectively, and every other saved believer, constitute the body of Jesus Christ in this world for the sake of God's purposes and reaching the lost and winning them to Jesus Christ. But, um, so he can't deny you your salvation anymore. He can, he's going to cut his own finger off or his own hand off. But, and I, so I pointed that out to my friend about eternal security. I said, the Bible tells us that we're already seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6. I said, that's right now. Part of you and me is in the third heaven. Um, with Jesus Christ. We're waiting for these bodies to one day be changed by Him and catch up with the soul, with the spirit. But until that time happens, uh, this, this, these bodies of flesh are weak. Paul writes about this in Romans 7, Romans 8, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, the, the good that I would, I do not, but the, the evil which I would not, that I do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing. The things I, I know I should do, I don't do. And if the greatest Christian who ever lived struggled with that, don't be surprised if you struggle with it. Yeah. And yet, it was the Apostle Paul who gave us the great verses on eternal security and God keeping us saved, like the one I just read to you in 2 Timothy 2. But, so the believer uh, is, no, is in no danger of losing his salvation, but he sure can forget about it if he doesn't hold fast onto it, remind himself of it. Remind yourself of uh, how your life was before you got saved. Now, I got saved as a little boy, and I don't have a lot of remem uh, memories about my life when I was three, four, five, six years old before I got saved. Um, I do remember, I, you know, one of the most vivid memories, I guess I do recall, I was probably four or five years old. Um, my mom and dad took us to meet this old black lady. I remember her sitting in her chair in the house we went to. I didn't know who she was. That was Ethel Waters, the great uh, famous singer and an actor, black uh, actress back in the 1930s, 40s. And she was saved, and she sang a lot at the Billy Graham Crusades in the 50s and 60s. Uh, maybe even the early 70s, I don't recall when she passed, but um, I remember meeting that lady. I do remember that. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, memories about my early childhood. Uh, maybe around that time, six, seven years old, we went down to uh, the Crystal Cafeteria, Brother and Sister Underhill, one, I think it was one Sunday after church in Los Angeles. That was the only time in my life I'd ever been there. And right across the street, after we were done eating, there was a group of Hare Krishnas in their orange or tangerine robes with a little ponytail up their shaved heads, playing their cymbals and their music instruments and making a chant. Of course, I was a six, seven-year-old kid. My eyes were big. I didn't know what in the world that was. But that's okay. Nobody else knew what they were either. <laughs> they don't even know what they are. And uh, so I remember that, but beyond those, I don't have very many other memories of my life prior to getting saved at six years old. But the day that I did get saved may be the most vivid memory I have 
of my early childhood. It's just as real in my mind right now as if it happened two weeks ago. And it's been 51 years. In fact, it'll be 51 years tomorrow that I got saved. Uh, November 5th, 1967. And I don't know how else to describe it except to say that. It's the most vivid memory of my early childhood. Maybe it'll be the most vivid memory in my mind for eternity. And I'm old. If, I'm, if I live to be old and decrepit and lose my mind and dementia and senility and all those things sit in. And sometimes we think they're coming on early, right? <laughs> I pray that that will still be a memory I keep in my mind and never be able to forget it. You know how they talk about folks suffering those um, conditions. They don't remember what they had for breakfast, but they remember what they did 45 years ago, right? And I pray that it's that way with me if I uh, live before Christ comes back to that point. Anyway, a Christian should never forget uh, what his life was before God saved him. He should never forget answers to prayer because God has saved him. God loves him. He should never forget the, the comfort he receives from the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God and the friendship and the fellowship of other Christians. Um, and if those, it's those things that should prompt the Christian to continue loving God, to continue seeking to do something for Jesus' sake, to represent Jesus Christ well wherever you go. And uh, verse 15 in this text says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. This was discussed back in chapter 2, verse 18. Look over there. It says, For that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He can identify with you. Unlike the priests who uh, were holier than thou and sanctimonious, our priest can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. When you're sick, he knows all about it. When you're tired and worn out uh, and depressed and discouraged, uh, he's right there. It touches him. It reaches him. And he's not insensitive to the plight of his... Uh, children. He's not insensitive or indifferent uh, or unfeeling, uncaring uh, to the needs of men and women and children. Um, does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song, when the burdens press and the cares distress and the weight grows weary and long? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. Amen. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary or long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. And, uh, but since um, Christians make up his body, then they suffer and rejoice with other Christians as well. Go back, if you will, to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians 12 and verses 25 and 26. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. The Bible says in Galatians 6, 2, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, when um, someone gives a testimony about some blessing God gave to them, something that came and fell in their lap, which they weren't counting on, we should rejoice with them. We should thank God for that. When someone has a, a trial or they're going through a very difficult time, might be a financial problem, might be a medical problem, might be some family squabble that they don't know what to do with, then you and I are burdened for that. We care about them. We take them their matters to our, our heart, and we add them to our own prayer lists, and uh, bring those needs to God, and let God know that the brethren are thinking of that one man, that one sister, and uh, care what happens to them. And we want God's best 
to affect their welfare. It says, in all points tempted like as we are. Not with each specific temptation that you have ever endured, but the same methods, the same means of temptation in your day were operating in the day of Christ. Um, go forward, if you will, to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. First John 2 and verses 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, now he lists them, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Those three things, those three elements seem to make up every temptation uh, in one way or another. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Uh, <clears throat> now I want you to go all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Notice there verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, there's the pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So the same mean, the same method, the same ways by which uh, temptation is presented to every man and woman since the Garden of Eden are the same ways that Satan presents it to you. It's just the, the types of, uh, the elements of the temptation are different. There was no such thing as internet uh, pornography in the day of Christ, right? But it certainly is here. It's the same thing. It, it, it appeals to the lust of the eyes, that's obvious, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, thinking I'm getting away with it, my boss doesn't catch me using the company computer for that purpose, or my husband or my wife doesn't catch me doing it while they're out of the house or looking at it. The pride of life, thinking I'm going to get away with something. And that's, that's you know, nobody ever committed a crime thinking he was going to get caught doing it. He only committed it uh, assuming he was going to get away with it and not be caught. That's the pride of life, to think... if. Um, if I say unto every man among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith, Romans 12, verse 3. So uh, uh, don't kid yourself thinking, I got away with it today, I'll get away with it tomorrow, the next day, and so forth. One day there's going to come a reckoning, and uh, you won't get away with it forever. Uh, not, even if no one else sees it, God sees it. You'll have to give an account to him one day, either as an unsaved man, was one more reason why you have no need, you have no uh, place in heaven, or a saved man, one more reason, you are disobedient, one more case in which you were a disobedient Christian at that moment, and not living the kind of life God would want you to live. But then he says, back in our text, um, I go back to Hebrews Hebrews chapter 4 and verse uh, 16. Um, because Christ can identify with you, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. He says grace and mercy. We may obtain mercy. I mentioned this in our sermon time, that mercy is what keeps God from giving you what you really do deserve. Boy, um, Dr. Ruffin illustrated this one time when I, I think my dad and I went to hear him preach when he was here in California. And he said, um, 
not so much out west here or up in the northern states, but down in the south, where people have a lot more space, a lot more trees on their property, uh, years ago they tell their kid to go cut a switch to get their spanking with. And of course the kid goes out and finds this tiny little skinny thing that's not going to hurt enough. Dad and mom said, go out and get another one. And uh, Dr. Ruckman illustrated this this way, that when you're in for a spanking, um, and your dad's hanging on to you, and he's got, you know, you, you don't want to pull away. You don't want to pull away because he's got his whole arm's reach. He's going to hit you in, even harder. He said, but when your dad's going to spank you, the time to get in close is then. That way he's got to hit down like this. It doesn't hurt so badly. <laughs> and when you're going through troubles, trials, um, suffering, infirmities of this life, that's the time to get in close with God. That's the time to call out to God, cry out to God, get as close as you can to God, and see if He doesn't rescue you. We have a couple in this room right now, Brother Manuel and Sister Brittany, they were telling me their testimony. They were at their, the end of their rope, not knowing what to do. And they just held each other and cried out to God for help. And God began to help. God began to answer. That's what you got to do. Let us come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. And if he's your heavenly father, you don't have to go through the secretary or the outer office person or the security guard. You barge right into your dad's office and say, Dad, I need some help. He's not going to turn you away. Amen. He's not going to say no or come back later or make an appointment. He's not going to tell you that. And um, that's the wonderful thing about being able to call upon God, our great high priest. And um, I'll close with this thought, which I've conveyed to you before. If you go through hardships and trials and problems and temptations and the weaknesses of the flesh in this life, and you cry out to God for help, uh, God can't say, I understand, if he's never gone through it too. And through the person of Jesus Christ, he can now say, I know what it is to be tempted. I know what it is to be forsaken. I know what it is to be hungry, to be cold, to be spat upon, to be rejected by your own family and your closest friends. I know what all of those things are like. And um, just as John says, um, the, the books, uh, the whole world cannot contain the books that should be written of the things Jesus did. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. But just as he says that, we have to uh, assume there must have been some temptations uh, presented to Jesus by carnal men and, and women along the way that weren't recorded for us in the Bible. Yeah. And yet he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. The Bible says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Now what a wonderful uh, truth, what a wonderful thing to think that our Savior lived as a man, he walked as a man, he can identify with men, but unlike men, he had no sins of his own that needed to be forgiven. And so when he died, he was dying for my sin. He was being judged for my sake, on my behalf, and bearing my judgment that I should have received. Amen. All right, let's stop right there. We'll close uh, the end of chapter 4 for today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you to conclude these thoughts in our minds. May they be a blessing to us. Um, we thank you that we have indeed a high priest greater than any priest in the world. The priests of men could not do what Jesus Christ does for us. And uh, no one else can truly identify with our plight, with our needs, and our problems like the Lord Jesus does. And uh, on that basis, God, we come to you boldly saying thank you that you can identify with us and uh, we need help, God. And only you can supply it for us. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> <laughs> no. 